you see up there? So far away. <laughs> it's still very far away. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Lacey, and I'm the Chief Program Manager for Benson County. today about uh, recommendations from the Union of Care Board regarding shelter capacity currently. I wanted to start by reviewing the recommendation from the National Alliance Against Homelessness, which was part of their within reach study. And so the response, the recommendation was to increase the crisis response capacity to meet 30% of the immediate problem solving and shelter needs of unsheltered individuals. They go on to further specify that they think that those shelters need to be effective, and they define effective as those that embrace a housing first approach, implement a diversion, and also offer immediate and low barrier access to folks who are experiencing homelessness. <coughs> so the initial response to that recommendation by the National Alliance was that the Homeless Initiative Advisory Committee which as you know at that time was the governing board for the continuum of care, decided to prioritize some of the recommendations within that report and this shelter recommendation was one of those. They formed a shelter work group and that work group did a lot of research and work which um, led to an issuance of an RFP, a request for partnership for a temporary shelter bed expansion. There were responses to that, which led to a request for county and city ARPA funding, and that funding was awarded to Safe Shelter, Haywood Street, and the Salvation Army. Um, and those beds have been funded, or will be funded rather through December of 2024 with that temporary response. So you can see here that the National Alliance recommended that we add 95 beds to our community. Um, with this initial response, we added 43, and we also sustained an, an existing 45 beds at the Salvation Army. So that leaves us with a balance at the time of this temporary response of 52 beds. Once that initial effort was completed, once the work group had finished their process and the providers were identified for this temporary expansion, Kayak asked the city and the county to provide support in developing a longer term response um, to the emergency shelter recommendation. And as a response to that request, the shelter planning team was formed. This was a joint effort from the county, the city, and Hayek. Their goal was to develop a set of recommendations for longer term, low barrier shelter bed expansion. <clears throat> they um, came up with those recommendations pertaining to operations as well as space and potential location. Um, and they, that, that was presented to Hayek and Hayek endorsed those recommendations in February of this year. Concurrently with all of this shelter work, the new continuum of care was getting up and running. And once the continuum of care board was elected and began meeting, the shelter planning efforts migrated over into that new continuum of care. So the new board decided to form a shelter planning work group to continue the efforts to figure out long-term low barrier capacity. So this work group met throughout the summer and incorporated a lot of engagement with stakeholders into their processes. There were two advisor sessions for COC members and the public. Both of those occurred on June 26th of this year. Um, we also had individuals who were currently experiencing homelessness attend our work group meeting to talk with us about their experience with shelters in the community and provide some feedback about what they think is needed. And we also had Buncombe County staff at meetings to provide clarification on the potential funding opportunity available, which is county ARPA funding that had been earmarked for affordable housing and shelter. So the work group developed a new RFP and the city as the lead agency released that RFP on behalf of the COC. So this RFP was seeking proposals for shelter expansion, utilizing those remaining ARPA funds, and then 
the work group completed an evaluation process of the proposals received in order to present a written plan to meet unmet shelter needs to the COC board. So I wanna share a little bit about the RFP itself before I talk about the two proposals that we received. Um, the RFP provided um, information that responding entities should demonstrate ability to operate in a low barrier capacity. So that looks like no ID requirements, no requirement for sobriety, allowing pets, um, room for families, just really removing typical barriers that, that might exist for folks to get into shelter. Um, and there was also specific information in the RFP about the shelter planning team's recommendations, including the recommendation for 100 non-congregate shelter beds and 50 additional congregate beds in flexible space. And then, of course, there was a desire for respondents to serve populations who are unable to access existing shelters. The period of performance defined in the RFP was that contracts would begin in September of this year and operations could begin as early as January 2025 with services provided for a minimum of one year. And then again, operations really focused around low barrier access, so reducing typical barriers to entry, um, extensive staffing and more intensive management of low barrier facilities is usually needed, so that was outlined in the RFP as well. Supportive services on site and then alignment with Housing First best practices. So as I mentioned, we received two proposals in response. I want to talk about those two response, those two proposals in response to the RFP now. The first one was for Haywood Street Respite. They are proposing to add a second floor and an elevator to their existing location at 297 Haywood Street. <coughs> with this expansion, they will add 13 beds and their proposal includes a request for operating support, which would also provide some support for their nine original beds and the three beds that were added during the HIAC led expansion effort. So that's a total of 26 beds in, at the respite <coughs> with this proposal. Haywood Street currently serves unhoused adults who are in need of medical respite care. And with this expansion, they would like to also be able to serve individuals in need of behavioral health respite and substance use respite. Their referrals come from medical providers currently, mostly because of the a current funding stream which requires that, but their long-term vision is to be able to accept referrals from other providers in the community as well. Haywood Street's request, uh, the total request is for just over 1.6 million. 860,000 of that is capital for the construction at their facility to add that second floor and elevator. They will need to temporarily relocate either to a partner church or potentially to a commercial space where they would pay rent. Dependent upon which of those relocation options pans out, they plan to have their 13 new beds operational by July 2025 or possibly sooner if they are in a commercial space that is uh, an appropriate size to do that. They're also requesting uh, 614,000 for operating support. <clears throat> they have a multi-year grant from the National Institute for Medical Respite Care. This is currently a significant source of funding for the respite, respite and that will end on June 30th of 2025. They have been participating in the NC HOP pilot that's part of the Medicaid expansion and they state that they've, they think that this appears to be a good opportunity for long-term funding sustainability but they also mention in their proposal that they anticipate that additional grant funding, private donations, and public support will still be needed. I wanna also share um, some information about how their proposal lines up with low barrier recommendations. <clears throat> Haywood Street Respite's operations are largely in alignment with the shelter team recommendations. There's no ID required for entry, no sobriety requirement. They accommodate pets. They are LGBTQIA friendly, and they're open 24 seven. They practice harm reduction principles and they offer some day services, particularly on Wednesdays when their downtown welcome table is operating. They have a lot of <clears throat> partnerships for supportive services already in place. Appalachian Mountain Community Health Services, Western North Carolina Community Health Services, and community paramedics 
are on site at various times throughout the week um, to provide support. They, I know that Western North Carolina Community Health Services brings their mobile unit on site. They have behavioral health um, services on site. They hired a behavioral health clinician and that individual provides um, individual and group therapy. They also have partnerships with other providers in the community and can refer out. Um, they work with each guest to find whatever is an appropriate long-term placement in terms of housing. So it could be a long-term care facility. It may be um, another shelter once their need for respite care has ended, or it could be permanent housing. And then their program manager acts as a case manager on site to coordinate care to connecting partner agencies. Before I move on to our second proposal, are there any questions about this one? I mean, I think that it would be integrated just in the sense of potential collaboration, that the program manager for Haywood Street, that's a, a Haywood Street employed the position that already exists, and they, they really act as a care coordinator to connect to other case management and other support services. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we also received a proposal from Safe Shelter. They are um, planning to move to Trinity United Methodist Church's educational building, which is at 587 Haywood Road. And they, will, they want to upfit this building with a sprinkler system and showers. At this location, they would maintain the 20 beds that were previously funded with the high Athlet expansion but these beds would become mostly non-congregate rather than congregate. It would be dependent upon household size, but they're gonna try to do non-congregate as, as best they can. They're also adding five new congregate beds and they're gonna offer an additional five emergency overflow beds as needed. Safe Shelter currently serves adults and families with children under 18. They prioritize families with children under 18, and they're going to continue to pri prioritize that population, but they do also serve individual adults. They accept referrals from providers in the community, and unhoused individuals and households can also self-refer. <clears throat> they have a lot of strong partnerships for referrals, particularly with McKinney Vento staff at the city and the county, and those folks often refer families for their services. In order to proceed with their stated capital plan, Safe Shelter will need to pursue a rezoning and permitting process. They have applied for a temporary use permit for the time being, and they have moved into the, um, not the educational building, but the church itself for now, as of, as of September. And once they know about funding support for sure, they would be able to, to move into the educational building and start working on um, changing their operations. So they're in contact with the staff at the city about those processes for rezoning and permitting. Uh, it's not currently clear how long the process might take or if it's going to definitively go through. Safe Shelter's total proposal amount was around 1.2, almost 1.3. 450,000 of that is capital for the work on the educational building at Trinity, <clears throat> and then 846,000 for a year of operating expenses. They have recently hired a development and engagement specialist who's focusing on long-term sustainability and fundraising for Safe Shelter. They have uh, diverse funding sources already in place, and they're looking also to see how Medicaid expansion could support their work. Because of the uncertainty of this project due to the rezoning and permitting processes, the COC Shelter Work Group recommended partial funding for this project in the amount of $1,002,391. And the COC board supported that recommendation. And I'm realizing now that I forgot to tell you <laughs> that the COC board and the work group support funding Haywood Street's recommendation in full. Lacey, let me ask you two, <coughs> two questions. Yeah. <coughs> Can you remind me why the recommended reduction uh, in award, what, how is that connected to the zoning? Uh, just in what way is that 
Well, the work group the work group was really concerned just about the viability of the project because the zoning is unknown and there was additional need identified outside of the RFP process that I'm gonna talk about momentarily. And so as they were kind of weighing decision making, I think they were trying to figure out how best to support um, as many beds in the community as they could possibly support and because we don't know for sure if the rezoning process will take, if the permanent permitting process will take, there's a little bit of uncertainty about an alternative location if, that, if it doesn't work at Trinity. Um, the work group decided it would be best to just offer a little bit less than full funding support. Do you happen to know what the current zoning of the property is? I do not know what the current zoning of the property is. I guess I would have assumed it's a, ch it's a church. Continuing work is probably already done, right? Maybe at a larger it's scale. Been a, it's been a group proposal site. It's been a temporary site as part of this consortium. I think um, I'm guessing it's zoning issues that sort of were, I'm guessing, similar to ones that came up when the other sky was trying to do the beloved project um, yeah. where the, I, I think there are ways to work through the, that process. This is your world more than mine. It just seems, um, <laughs> just seems like it should be exempt. But I, yeah. I, I think there's some interesting questions yeah. on the table about how to support faith communities and responding to housing needs. Yeah. So maybe this is an occasion to revisit some of them. Well, so you might, you just want to live in on site 24 seven and that's the piece that they need to make sure we get zoning for. So right now church is institutional, but it's not right. for the live-in. Right, okay. And helping folks during the day as opposed to being re uh, full-time with them. I see, okay. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to share a little bit about how this proposal aligns with low barrier considerations. Um, and again, <clears throat> there is a, a good bit of alignment. There's no ID requirement. They do allow pets, although they, they ask that pets be on leash um, most of the time. They are not serving sex offenders because they're serving families with children under 18. Um, they do allow, there's no sobriety requirement, but they do ask that visibly intoxicated individuals who may stay in their facility stay in their rooms, mostly to minimize contact with the children that may be in the shelter. Um, they want to offer 24-7 services once the contracting process is complete. Uh, they are going to offer drop-in hours for families with children under 18 and shelter guests can stay on site. They also have a partnership with Appalachian Mountain Community Health um, and their mobile unit is on site weekly and they have a strong partnership with community paramedics and their, uh, their staff are community health workers as well. In terms of behavioral health care, uh, the community paramedic clinicians have indicated that they would be willing to provide additional hours for behavioral health support, and they have other partnerships in place for referrals as well. Um, and then for substance use support, it's similar. Clinicians and community health workers will provide support and they'll make referrals as needed. They have strong partnerships with the Housing Authority, Homeward Bound, and Elida Homes, among others, for help with housing placement. Um, and their community health workers also provide case management services. Other questions about this proposal? All right, so um, there is an additional identified need that has presented itself, and that is for the Salvation Army. During the analysis phase um, that the work group was undertaking, uh, the Salvation Army communicated a need for support maintaining their current operations. They're not able to expand to any additional beds at this time, but there is also some concern that they may have to close their doors at the end of December once the Hayek led expansion funding is spent. They have submitted a proposal that was outside of that RFP process for operational support. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Salvation Army was part of the initial expansion. They added an additional 20 beds, so they have, they have 65 beds in operation now. Um, <clears throat> they're requesting 980,000 for another year of operations for those 65 beds through December of 2025. They serve adults and families with children under 18. The Asheville chapter of the Salvation Army is working with organization leadership in Atlanta 
on some strategic planning for a long-term vision that includes utilizing other property that they own in Asheville for additional shelter and transitional housing, but they need to secure their next year of funding in order to be able to move forward with that plan. So the COC Shelter Work Group uh, recommended full funding support for the Salvation Army as well as there's concern about losing those 65 beds and the COC board supported this recommendation. And so then briefly, I'll just show how this lines up. Um, I will say the Salvation Army, they are doing a lot of low barrier practices. Unfortunately, they can only allow service animals, but um, there's no ID, no ID requirement, no sobriety requirement. They are open 24 seven. They have case management on site during the day in close partnership with AHO. They have the Appalachian Mountain Community Health Center mobile unit on site every other week. Um, they have strong relationships with community partners to make referrals for behavioral health care and substance use support. Um, and then the, their case managers work with them on housing placement as well. Questions about the Salvation Army before I move on? So I just wanted to show you just kind of a comparison of how they line up in terms of low barrier access. Um, you can see none of them require IDs, which is great. Two of them allow pets. Only one is allowing sex offenders um, because the other two are serving families with children under 18. Um, no sobriety requirement at any of these facilities and they're all planning to be open 24-7. <coughs> The two proposals that were part of the RFP process are offering a lot of supportive services. The Salvation Army does have, as I mentioned, strong partnerships for referrals for those services. And I wanna just also point out that Safe Shelter is partnering with the YWCA currently to offer some childcare to shelter residents as well, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, so, the COC Board's recommendation um, as I mentioned, was full funding support for Haywood Street Respite for their proposal, so that's 1.6 million. Um, partial funding support for Safe Shelter in the amount of 1 million 2,000. And then uh, support for another year of operations <coughs> for the Salvation Army to $980,897. That brings us to 3.605 million, which is, would be full, fully utilizing the amount of ARPA funding that is currently left on the table. So, and I just wanna point out that in total, 115 beds for these projects are supported with county funding. And that's throughout the process of expansion since, we, since the Within Reach report was released. So there were 54 beds in operation at these three locations, and that's not all the beds in the community, but it's just all the beds for these three projects. 54 beds were in operation at the time of the release of the Within Reach report. 45 of those were preserved with that temporary response from HIAC, and another 43 were added. <clears throat> and the projects that are now up for consideration will add another 18 beds which means that the total number of beds added since the release of the Within Reach report would be 61. So I'm sharing all of this with you today to just provide a lot of information for your consideration. Happy to answer any questions. Um, strategic partnerships will be bringing a request for action to obligate ARPA funding for shelter projects at your meeting on September 17th. What questions do you have? Hi, it's Megan. Sorry, it's Megan. <laughs> hey, Liz. <laughs> she has a question. So I have a question just around because this a lot of these funds that are being requested are operational rather than capital, which I'd originally thought we were looking at capital so that we actually have expansion. Um, and so I'm wondering what if we're using that much for operation, what's the long-term plan with this for the viability of actually maintaining these and then how are we gonna meet these other goals as well for the expansion of beds? Um, well, 
That's a good question. I think that um, I will say the COC board uh, approved the shelter work group to continue meeting to, we want to get some updated target numbers for beds because the within reach target numbers were based on the 2022 PID count primarily and we've had two more of those since then and lots of permanent supportive housing and, and shelter has come online since then. So we want to get some updated numbers for what we still need. And then that work group is also gonna be working to kind of figure out what a long-term strategy may be as well as um, work to try to identify some funding sources. Um, I will say, that providers expressed kind of throughout the work group's final phase of, of work that uh, there may be some hesitation for providers to submit proposals because there's not known long-term operational funding sources at this point. Um, <clears throat> and that, would, that makes them hesitant, understandably so. You don't wanna take on a large expansion if you're not sure how you're going to fund it in the future. Um, so I, I think the, the short answer is we, we need to work to figure that out as a continuum of care and as a community support from, from county and city. Thank you, and I guess another part with that, so with the RFP, you were surprised that there were so few that actually applied, and, and was there other things that you think besides what you just said, are there other limiting factors to why we had so few apply? Um, I mean, I think that was a, a primary limiting factor. I don't, I don't know that I was surprised. I, I was hopeful that we would have a more robust response in terms of number of beds. Um, but having come from the nonprofit world, I can understand the hesitation. Um, I think also <clears throat> the only other thing that I may say is that I'm not sure um, if providers were able to locate a facility, particularly because the RFP, we were working kind of on a tight timeline, and the RFP was released and then due um, pretty quickly afterward. So that may have also had something to do with it. I'm not sure that any of the providers that responded currently have capacity at their facility, even with construction expansion for the kind of numbers that we were asking for. But I do think that the main the main hesitancy was around that ongoing funding support. And it really is, you know, reflective of the local ecosystem when we think about who our local providers are, um, and who the local providers are who have um, sort of fully embraced the low barrier approach to care. Um, th this is who the, this is who responded to the RFP. So. You know, unless we were going to see entities based outside of Buncombe County responding, this is kind of, a, uh, um, uh, you know, this is our local ecosystem um, that, you know, has has um, done really heroic work to date, but has not seen serious infusions of sustained public funding. So I think one thing we knew going into this is that it would, as RFPs often do, it would kind of. Um, give us a good read on kind of the vital signs of the local ecosystem and what the capacities of, of that are. So I think that's sort of another lens, an additional lens through which to look at the response. Any more questions for Lacey? All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. If yes. we could stay on yeah. this just for a second, because sure. it's, you know, sort of the um, fruition of a, a long process to get to this point and um, we will next talk about this when we vote. So I just want to yeah. make sure that if folks have questions about it, we can begin kind of discussing or airing those now. Um, Terry, appreciate your great questions. And I think, you know, having been one of the, been one person who's been working in this policy sphere for a while now, and Parker is on the COC, so we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Just, um, you know, this, the issue of how to provide um, these services in a way that get people into housing and address critical health needs is sort of the, meets all the definitions of like a complex policy problem. There's no one size fits all. Um, I think we went into, I, I think the work that's happened since NIEH met with us and city council, um, if we can take a step back from it, is really considerable. Um, we're in a really different place as a community um, than we were those two years ago, when you're thinking about the provision of high access service or low barrier services in particular, um, the number of beds, um, 
you know, as recently as last year, I, was, I would regularly hear stories about um, families with a single dad and kids living in their car because they were not eligible for any local shelter beds. Stories like that change because of things like this. Um, and, you know, I think as a fun, I'll share what my thoughts are, is that as, as we think about how to best deploy ARPA dollars to address this complex problem, um, I think we did our due, we have done our due diligence at the level of research and, and did our due diligence at the level of kind of conceptual design uh, in, in terms of thinking about, yes, it would be amazing if we could, if our local ecosystem could say, here's what the facility looks like, all we need are capital costs, we don't need any operational costs, we don't want any long-term commitments of operational costs. I think what, we, what we're hearing in that kind of call and response is we are ready to take the next step you know, um, and this is what that looks like. And also, um, there does need, to your point, to be a conversation at the community level, at the provider level, and at the political level, at the county and the city, I think, about um, what it looks like to sustain support for this kind of services. Um, this conversation completely echoes one we just had in our early childhood education committee. Um, and, uh, you know, where, when you're looking at whether it's early childhood work or um, responding to folks who are unhoused, um, those operational costs are recurring. You know, I, I, I like have so much admiration for the work with the housing bond, and I wish it were as simple as saying, let's go out and do a one-time capital cost, and that solves homelessness in our community or the early childhood crisis. But I think um, in, in this case, as in that case, there's this question for our community about what level of public investment we want to see moving forward um, uh, beyond you know, the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I, I will be on this body to help, uh, to be part of that conversation. I know you all who will be here will do a great job with it. Um, but I think the opportunity before us is sort of unprecedented for you know, 15, 20 years, people have been recommending that we significantly expand high access services in Buckland County and um, the work done in the last two years and then what we could be poised to do in, uh, in our next meeting and voting to approve this funding will be the most significant steps forward and advances in, in achieving that goal that our community has seen. So that just kind of wanted to share my perspective um, as someone who's sort of been down the rabbit hole of this um, process and really would welcome questions and opportunities to dialogue with folks as we head into the vote. And Parker, I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is that I, I'm extraordinarily impressed by these three entities putting all this together so quickly um, to try to help meet this need and meet the kind of the goal of these remaining funds. Um, I of course, I certainly wish there was some sort of kind of uh, uh, low barrier shelter emerging in one location to just kind of serve the community long term, but those funding opportunities aren't aren't obvious at the moment, the long-term operational funding opportunities. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's a good use of, of these funds. And hopefully, as Lacey alluded to, hopefully kind of the math here that we're looking at in terms of the need for beds uh, is getting better. And we're hoping this decision will, or this conversation will be easier 14 months from now, knock on wood. Be more directed for you because they are nonprofit entities. Mm -hmm. um, is there some? Are they looking at their own long-term sustainability? That with the assistance of these dollars, will they be able to leverage other dollars in terms of their fundraising? Because I think that will help answer some of our questions around the sustainability operational pieces versus sure. capital. Sure. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I would say um, all three entities are are very hard at work trying to identify additional funding sources and trying to find the funding sources that might be the most long-term for them. Um, but I think they also have made pretty clear that public support is gonna need to be in the mix there. I'll share with you all, just as an aside, wanting to get to understand these organizations better. I've spent some time um, I was really grateful to see the focus from Safe Shelter and Salvation Army on families. 
the first night that I got to Safe Shelter, I was there and they're like, go set up the parish hall for dinner, but make sure you get the high chairs. And it really took me aback for a moment that when I got there, there were toddlers and school age children who were sleeping in the church long term. Um, so I'm glad that we haven't forgotten about our youngest, most vulnerable members of our community as we're looking at this. All right, so anything else on, on this topic? All right. The next item is consideration of the sale of surplus real property. Michael Free is going to lead this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. We haven't, we're having this on briefing because uh, we haven't. Uh, conveyed a surplus property in seven or eight years. So it's been a long time. So just to come back to see how this works. A property next door uh, recently purchased. Uh, they were looking to see this vacant parcel. They'd like to clean it up and use it for their own. So they tracked me down. The way this process works is, is that if the county receives a bid for surplus personal property, then you have to take that bid and advertise it for 10 days. If there's no increased or upset bids, uh, then the county can approve a sale for that price and the county would give a non-warranty deed. So in this situation, the county came by this property because this is in uh, not far off Billmore Avenue in Kenilworth on Unadilla Avenue. Um, the first plat for the first subdivision in this old area was filed 100 years ago and this was an unnumbered plat and it got conveyed to a with, along with a group of numbered parcels about 90 years ago, and nothing ever occurred. So the county did foreclose on it. The county's had this property or through the Board of Tax Supervision since uh, 1974. So that's another 50 years. So we put this through the policy. I looked at it, planning, uh, uh, parks, and uh, equity. Everyone agreed there's no use for this property. So the recommendation is to sell this property. Checking with the assessor's office, they put the value of this property at $2,000. Uh, they have offered the $2,000 to buy the property. And then how do I use this Lillian? Maybe this arrow. Yes, there we go. Um, so the next step would be uh, if, the, if the board has no objections or no concerns, we put this on the consent agenda on the 17th. Um, then that would authorize the uh, advertisement for upset bids the next day. Let's see what happens during those 10 days. At only $2,000, it's, it's not likely that uh, other parties would bid on it because it is only 1,700 square feet. So it's probably not suitable for any uh, improved purposes. Um, so if there's no uh, further upset bids, the resolution would uh, uh, declare the property surplus and authorize the sale by non-warranty deed. So if there's no questions, no concerns, I'll proceed and have that on the consent agenda next time around. All right, Michael. Sounds good. Thanks. Sure. All right. And um, the next item is the Inca Recreation Design Contract and Grant Approval. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm here today in uh, Allison Dane's stead. Um, she will be before you on, at Commission on the 17th with the, with the request for board action. But I just wanted to be here to inform inform you uh, some updates on our Inca recreation destination, uh, specifically our phase two uh, um, po portion of that project. So a little bit of, of an overview of the project and our request. The Inca recreation destination has been under development since 2018 and with support from the TDA, the French Broad River MPO, and county commissioners, the project has made significant improvements to Buncombe County Sports Park. Uh, some of the major improvement or accomplishments involve uh, the artificial turfing of three of our multi-purpose sport fields out there uh, with lighting um, and some additional improvements. Um, the, the, the meat of the presentation presentation today is actually going to concentrate on this Inca Recreation Destination Phase 2, um, the award from the TPDF uh, in the amount of $4,054,415. Uh, 
uh, which will include money that will go towards turfing four additional fields with lighting for three of those, an accessible playground, a new shelter with uh, a, a lighting, uh, and then uh, renovating our concession stand to, to include a park ranger, contact station, and family restroom. Uh, we do have an RFQ that has been advertised for design services for ter artificially turfing those additional four fields and lighting three of them, uh, as well as the accessible walking path that will go around them. And then, like I said, the request for board action will come uh, at the September uh, 17th board meeting. It will be a request to, for a motion to accept the TPDF award for the Inca Recreation Destination Phase 2, a motion to approve the budget amendment for Inca Recreation Days Destination Phase 2, and a motion to approve the design contract with CDC for design services on the project. So some of the project's accomplishments so far, like I just said, we've turfed, uh, artificially turfed three of the fields out there, fields one, two, and eight. Uh, and lit them so we're extending the playable hours to meet county de demand uh, when it comes to our multi-sport uh, artificially turf fields. We've also provided seven sets of lighting for the Bob Lewis ball, uh, ball fields. Additionally, we've installed a restroom facility up at field nine, which is up at the top of the hill at the entry. Uh, and that, that prefab restroom building does include an EV charger station for county um, a county vehicle uh, at a remote location, which is kind of cool. Um, we've also installed some play structures uh, and shade structures at our dog park, uh, which is a very desirable uh, and heavily used amenity at the Buncombe County Sports Park. And then additionally, with this project, we've also repaved the entry road, repaved the parking lots, and then restriped uh, the lots out there to help with some of those heavier traffic days. Some components that are in progress currently are a restroom facility that we're building in uh, between the three newly turfed fields. So between fields eight, one, and two, this had to be a stick built uh, restroom. So it's, it's gonna match the pre prefab uh, restroom that we built at field nine, but it was stick built. So it's taken a little bit longer, uh, especially with the addition of a water line uh, that had to be added for this particular location, but it's moving along pretty pretty smoothly, and um, this project was uh, already, is funded with already approved funds from the TPDF in, in around $750,000, um, and it is scheduled to be complete this fall. I did want to mention that there is kind of an addition to this bathroom, too, on the side there. We are providing, uh, you can kind of see it there on the right-hand side, we are providing kind of a gathering space and a shelter. Uh, all, all three of those fields are a little bit exposed, so we wanted to provide uh, some sort of cover uh, for those whenever a storm may come up quickly, they can get under there and, and huddle. Um, and then the Inca Heritage Trail is also an ongoing project. Uh, the greater part of the last year for me was spent on this project uh, reestablishing our, our, our terminus on the west end of this project. We had to do so due to feasibility concerns and some environmental issues that came up with the BASF parcel on the western end of that terminus. However, we do have a 25% CD design set that we're willing or ready to submit to NCDOT soon. So we are making progress on that particular project. So the phase two of the Inca recreation destination really looks at you know, capitalizing on the momentum that we've made so far on, on the Buncombe County Sports Park. So we really want to turn the Buncombe County Sports Park into a premier sports park and family destination. Uh, and we plan to do that with these key features um, that are list, that listed down below here. Um, as, as I mentioned, turfing three addition, or four additional fields out at the sports park. That would be fields three, four, five, and nine that's at the top where the new uh, prefab restroom is be being built. We will light three of those fields. That's a purposeful uh, decision to only light three because field nine is directly adjacent to some residential neighborhoods and we don't, uh, we want to be good stewards and good neighbors. Um, so we do not want to provide basically like stadium lighting right in people's backyards. Um, 
Also, we want to update our concession stand that's out there to include an actual park ranger contact station um, and a family, uh, a renovated restroom to include a family restroom. Um, we want to update the, the pavilion or shelter that's out there between the concession stand and the current playground. And then we want to update that playground to be an inclusive or accessible playground as well. Um, we imagine that a future phase or a phase three of this project might include something like cover, covered sports courts, uh, additional parking, and then food truck hookups. So let's talk about the TPDF award that we received. Uh, and this is actually a typo here. In 2023, Buncombe County applied for TPDF funds and received a grant award. Um, the scope of those funds uh, were to be for very specific deliverables that they called out. Um, those were the artificial turfing of fields three, four, five, and nine, the lighting of fields three, four, and five, um, accessible bleachers and a walkway around those fields, installation of an inclusive accessible playground, renovation to that central uh, concession stand or restroom building to include that park ranger contact station, and then another typo here, it's not a parks and recreation office with community space, but actually uh, updating of that shelter that's in between the playground and the concession stand. So our Buncombe County request to TPDF was $6 million, and we'll get into those numbers here in a little bit. Uh, T the TPDF committee uh, approved funds in the amount of $4,054,415. Um, there is currently no additional revenue source identified at this time to make up the potential $2 million-ish gap uh, between the, uh, the projected project costs and what the TPDF funded. Um, we did reapply in May to the TPDF um, to make up that funding gap of $2 million. However, the committee did not move the for, uh, application forward into phase two, um, so we did not, we were unable to uh, see that request granted. So a little bit more on the specifics of our original ask. Um, you can see kind of all of our deliverables here that we listed out, um, projected costs, and you can see kind of why we were asking for six million specifically from the TPDF because using the cost that we had just received from our completed project of the three, the three fields that we just uh, completed, we projected out that uh, the field construction would come uh, for three, four, and five would come to about 4.2, field nine, 1.1, and then the lighting package for the three fields to come to about 700. So all of that kind of equaling $6 million, um, knowing that we have over a, over a $12 million project here, um, we just asked for the full six because it's a one-to-one -one match. Um, however, the TPDF committee said that based the design of our recreation building with a community space, the construction of that building, the escalation costs uh, were all not eligible for funding or, or to be matching funds. So they reduced the cost of the project to $8,108,830. And that's how we arrived at the previously mentioned $4,054,415. So we are pursuing uh, full engineering and design at this time so we can have full costs and design ready to ex execute uh, if we decide to move forward. An RFQ was advertised for design services for the four, uh, four turf sports fields, lighting, the accessible walking path, um, uh, and CDC or Civil Design Concepts, which is a local firm here in Asheville, was actually selected. Um, we negotiated a cost of $567,000 for that particular contract. This is a contract for not only design services, but we have to get survey out there. We have to do soil testing, uh, geotech. It does get us 100% construction documents and permitting. Um, and that will get us to way more accurate cost estimates. And so the next steps for this would be uh, to award the de design contract uh, for the fields, lighting, and accessible walking path. 
to develop a revised budget based on the real costs that we receive uh, from that 100% design set, and then uh, give a project update to the Board of Commissioners with uh, some uh, strategies that would handle that projected $2 million funding gap that we currently have. So again, Allison will be before you, Director Danes will be before you uh, on September 17th, requesting these uh, board actions, a motion to accept the TPDF award in the amount of $4,054,415 for the Inca Recreation Destination Phase 2, a motion to approve the budget amendment for the Inca Recreation Destination Phase 2, and a motion to approve the $567,000 design contract with CDC for design and engineering services. And Thomas, did you say when you come back with to us with that information, you'll also share kind of the plan for how you're looking at that additional funding, that gap in funding? Correct. Okay. Yep. And then the, um, when you were going over, while we didn't receive that funding, you said that it was because they were not counting those certain aspects of the project? Yes. And so can you just speak a little bit more to that? Is that just part of their criteria, their specific criteria within that grant? I certainly can't speak for that committee, but um, we were told that they weren't being able to directly tie that to increasing room night stays. So they could do that with the fields, but not the kind of other park amenities. And then, and then just one final question. Looking on there, it looks like there's potentially some additional fields. And I know whenever I was, when we were out there at Inca High School, people were asking for basketball courts and you've heard about pickleball. Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, potentially, field? yeah. I mean, we've heard it through our master planning process too that we're going through. So we're already thinking ahead about what um, that space could be utilized as. Currently, those are uh, where those courts are being shown or, um, fields, but those fields are uh, closed regularly due to poor soils, poor um, kind of, it's really hard to be able to maintain those fields, uh, and we do not believe that they would be suitable for artificial turf. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yep. Thomas, this is more of a comment than a question, but I'll try to, try to make it one at the end. Um, there's a huge disconnectivity opportunity with this awesome project. Um, and a safe routes to school opportunity as well with Sand Hill, um, uh, Sand Hill Federal Elementary School and um, just, just the residential areas that are to the north and east there, connecting them to this park, connecting them to the new Inca Greenway. And then there's, there's new residential going in, thank goodness, across uh, Smoky Park Highway as well. Um, and so just, just for folks that might end up on the MPO one day, I guess it's not me, um, there's also a, a, a plan on that comically long list of planned projects uh, to, to do a, a bit of a road diet there um, to slow traffic down because it's a nightmare right now. Um, and in that project, hopefully, maybe, we could request some pedest pedestrian access across Smoky Park Highway. Hard to imagine currently, I know. Um, but to connect that residential area to the north across the highway as well to the park. And that also allows folks to would allow for a safe right, uh, route to elementary school and to uh, the intermediate school to the south there as well. So, um, yeah, that's just really exciting. And hopefully we think about those connectivity options as well uh, with our GOT partners as cool projects like this get, get built and expanded. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely uh, are looking to capitalize on that connectivity whenever possible. So. I'd argue it's yeah, a little bit under uh, under advertised that part of this this project, I think. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about this project. This, this discussion kind of prompted me to think of it. When, uh, so when is the um, timeline? And if you don't have it on the spot, that's fine. Look it up and send it to us. Or maybe maybe Tim would know or something. But when is the timeline for then there's the TPDF fund and there's the legacy fund, lift. is that what it's called? Lift fund, sorry. When is the application timeline for the lift fund? It's, they're currently being 
assessed. So I don't have the exact dates, but it's essentially like a late summer to fall kind of a process. So it's they're currently uh, assessing applications for lift. So the application deadline has passed. Is that what yes, okay. for for this cycle. Yes. The Thomas is right. The, the grant deadlines are kind of evolving a little bit, uh, but what I can tell you, the first lift cycle we participated in, and now we're gearing up for the next lift cycle, which will be this fall. So right September, October timeframe, where they would be accepting new applications for the latest version of lift. Um, currently, um, as Thomas was saying, uh, the committee, the TPDF committee, is considering who will get awarded um, from the current f phase of TPEF um, funding. So there's, that's, un that's been around with us for like almost 20 years, TPDF yeah. lift is coming up here um, in the near future. The, the application window will open for the next lift cycle, like to this month? Yep, end of September, beginning of October. We don't have an exact date yet. It hasn't been published. Okay. Um, and then once it opens, there'll be a period of time before it closes again. So it's, um, that might be a little bit, like it'll open and then it'll be some period of time. So That's correct. Okay. And so, um, and forgive me if I'm um, spacing this out, but um, has there been, um, has, like, do we have some ideas for that cycle? And have we discussed those or just like, yeah? We, yeah. um, we'll be at board briefing. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I, the only thing I would say is like, let's, if we're going to talk about it, we should probably talk about it. So if there's any other ideas, like we don't talk about it so late that like there's no more opportunities to kind of consider potential projects. Because there's always, you know, a lot of different ideas, right? So, um, okay. All right. Well, thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. All right. Other questions about this project? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's everything that's on the agenda. Were there any other items to cover? Okay. We're adjourned. Is that your card? Should we take all our stuff?